My name is Lawrence. I'm joined on stage by my colleagues, Burnett and Chuck. And today we're going to be talking about Vue 5.1 and the PCOIP remoting protocol that it uses. Um, before we get into the details, the normal disclaimer, future looking, yada, yada, yada. Um, so we're going to start off with myself talking about some of the enhancements that are debuted with the recently released Vue 5.1. I'll then turn, turn over to my colleague, Burnett, who will talk about how VMware View uh, performs compared to some other the remoting solutions out there today. And then we'll conclude with Chuck, who will talk about you know, PCYP deep, uh, deep dive, best practices, how to optimize and get the most out of your VDI deployment. So we introduced a lot of enhancements into Vue 5.1. We can't touch on all of them today, but I want to just give you se several of the high points. So let's start off with talking about the PCYP encoder itself that sits on the virtual desktop. As you guys know, it's a process there. Basically, it captures the, uh, the desktop images that are being rendered and then remotes them to your client device. Um, going from 4.5 to 5, we actually spent a lot of time optimizing this process, and we've continued that forward to Vue 5.1. Uh, a lot of SIMD optimization, a lot of algorithmic tweaks, a lot of hand-coded assembly, and we've managed to further bring down the PCIP overheads by an additional 1.3x. So you're going to see this whether you be running office-style workloads or high frame rate workloads like video playback. And this is what I'm showing here on these uh, plots at the bottom of the slides. Um, this is a CPU utilization breakdown for an office-style workload, in this case, uh, PowerPoint slideshow, and for video playback. And there's two things to note. First of all, for both of these workloads, you actually see going from left to right, view 5 to 5.1 you see the PCYP encoder overheads decrease. Blue bar gets smaller, which is good. The second thing to notice is as well that in a lot of these cases now, the PCYP encoder overheads are becoming vanishingly small. You're spending most of your time actually running the desktop application, not remoting those images to your client, which is good as well, right? It's what you want. This is especially true in the office workload, but it's also increasingly true in the video workloads themselves, especially if you're capping your maximum frame rate. So if you're setting it to something like 12, 15, 17 frames a second, you actually find that the majority of the CPU is being sent just playing back the video. So a lot of benefits in this. Obviously, if we're spending less CPU cycles handling each virtual desktop, you can stack more virtual desktops per core, more per host. And as you scale out your VDI deployment, you're going to see potentially the requirement for less hardware, which translates into cost savings. The other thing is, if we're spending less CPU cycles, we're doing things a little bit faster, everything feels a little bit more responsive, improvements in user experience. So let's switch now from the, the desktop to the client. And in Vue 5.1, we spend a lot of time optimizing our soft client implementation. We've done this for both x86 and ARM. And I think you'll see that in many cases, especially for high frame rate work workloads, there is a very significant uptick in performance up to a 4x improvement in frame rate compared with where we were with previous view releases. And remember, this is exactly the same hardware. All you're doing is upgrading the software bits on your clients. This is what I'm illustrating here on the plot down the left. Um, this is for an Atom. So basically, single core hyperthreaded Atom, what you may find in a thin client today. You can see that for 360, 480, 720, or even when you full screen a video, you'll be, you're seeing between 2.5 and 4x improvement in performance. On the right-hand side of the slide, we have some ballpark um, performance estimates. If you have a halfway decent x86 desktop, you're going to see good 1080p performance. If you have a sort of decent thin client, you're going to see decent 720p performance. And for an ARM, sort of lower-end thin client running an ARM, you're going to see good 480p performance. So again, just to stress the magnitude of the benefits that we actually see with Vue 5.1, I draw your attention to the bottom right. Here we have the performance uptick for a variety of different thin clients. And here, if we compare um, a very low-end ARM, basically a 1 gigahertz single-core ARM processor running Vue uh, 5.1, and compare that with, a, the, with the performance of a single-core hyper-threaded 1.7 gigahertz Atom running Vue 5, you can see they're now roughly equivalent. So that actually gives you some sense of the magnitude of the performance increase that you can actually get by switching to the Vue 5.1 soft clients. So let's now shift our focus to the network itself. We spend a lot of time in Vue 5.1 
improving how PCYP and VUE responds to a variety of different network environments, especially hostile networks. Um, pre you know, if we see a lot of uh, packet loss, if we see variable latency, if we see deep buffering and things like that, our response is a lot more graceful than it used to be. Previously, if we saw loss, we tended to equate that to congestion, and so we'd back down the frame rate, we'd back down the bandwidth, which is the correct thing to do if you think about it. If you've got a bunch of PCYP sessions uh, sharing a bandwidth-constrained link, you don't want them to be fighting for bandwidth, you want them to be good citizens. But what we've done now is essentially we've increased the sophistication of our network monitoring in the PCYP encoder, and now if we believe that the, the loss and the problems are not symptomatic of congestion, then we actually maintain the frame rate, maintain the bandwidth, and so we continue to remote at a high frame rate. That said, you know, when we're monitoring all of these network uh, metrics, if we do believe we're seeing congestion, then we will, of course, back down the bandwidth gracefully and gradually. You know, we, so now we're doing the right thing in both, in both situations. So this is what I'm showing here on the slide down here on the left. Basically, uh, I've got PCYP running over the LAN. I'm remoting a video with high frame rate, about 30 frames a second. I then turn on my traffic shaper, which starts introducing packet loss, at this point denoted by the red dashed line. And you can see that quite quickly we figure out what's going on and continue remoting the, um, the video with a high frame rate over 20 frames a second. So obviously this translates to improved performance in the WAN before improved performance in the extreme WAN, and also very nicely improved performance of the Wi-Fi, and this is especially important given that more and more people are connecting to their view desktops from their laptops or their tablets over, the, over Wi-Fi. And you can see here the kind of performance improvement that you can expect moving from View 5 to View 5.1 when you're connecting with your um, Android or iPad device. It's about 1.5 to 2x performance improvement. So the other topic I want to touch upon is uh, interactivity uh, with VMware View. What we try to do is deliver a user experience that's akin to running on your local physical desktop that sits on your desk. And one of the things we've done in View 5.1 is significantly improve our interactivity. So basically, if you're clicking around, scrolling, you're interacting rapidly with your desktop, things feel a lot smoother, a lot more fluid, a lot more responsive. And you can actually see about a 2x improvement in frame rate for these type of events, so much improved user experience. And this is what I'm showing here with these plots at the bottom. At first glance, you may feel these look a little arbitrary, but we've actually, you know, two points to that. First of all, we've actually found that a lot of customers use Microsoft Paint to actually gauge, gauge desktop performance. They draw circles or they draw spirals, and what they want to see is nice smooth circles, nice smooth spirals rather than sort of crude polygons. The second thing we found is that this test is actually a good proxy for estimating overall desktop interactive performance and overall responsiveness. So on the right-hand side, we have the plot that was drawn in this test when we we're running on a native system, just on physical, our physical local desktop. In the middle, we have the plot that was drawn when we were running with View 5.1, and you can see that it's a pretty good facsimile of the native solution. We're actually showing sort of equivalent interactive performance, if you will. And this is especially true if we contrast it with the plot that was drawn using RDP 7 over the LAN. I mean, it bears, it's sort of night and day. It bears very little resemblance to the actual native plot. I mean, it's, you know, definitely suffering from these crude polygonization. So two more things I want to touch upon before I hand over to my colleague. Um, firstly, um, AV synchronization. So what some people can see when they're running uh, video playback in the VDI environment is you find that your video and your audio streams drift slightly, you get lip sync problems, and it really you know, destroys user experience. It you know, makes the video sort of unwatchable in some scenarios. So what we've done with View 5.1 is we've significantly improved the audio handling in our soft client and significantly tightened up AV sync. It's about 2x uh, better than in previously releases of View, so you should see a much more pleasant video playback um, when you're using the latest rev, rev of view. And this plot here is just to demonstrate at VMware now we've actually developed a lot of tools and techniques for automatically, accurately, and at scale uh, monitoring various metrics associated with user experience. And so basically, we can stress views that are in view in all sorts of different consolidation ratios, different network environments, and continue to ensure that we actually do deliver good user experience in all of these cases. So we're monitoring things like frame rate, interactivity, audio fidelity, image quality, AV sync. 
I've actually published some papers on this recently. They're on the VMware website if you're interested. So the last point I want to touch upon is client memory footprint and image cache compression. With Vue 5, we introduced client-side image caching where we hang on to and cache the most recent image blocks that come across the, um, come across the wire, and then if they're actually reused later in the session, we don't have to go to the effort of re-encoding and retransmitting them. We just reference those cache entries. And obviously, that's a big bandwidth saving, as we talked about last year. We see 20% you know, plus reduction in bandwidth uh, from using these techniques for typical office workloads. And on the right-hand side as well, you can see the efficiency with which um, you know, the caching works. Here we have an example where 40% of, um, of the pixels coming over the wire are coming from the cache, and you can see that they're actually contributing a negligible amount to the overall bandwidth consumption. So a number of advantages to this. First of all, it reduces your um, memory footprint of the client. Secondly, it um, allows you to run with bigger effective cache sizes. And thirdly, it also allows us going forward to enable caching on memory-constrained devices such as tablets. You'll find today that while we have caching support across a lot of our soft clients, we don't have it currently on Android or iPad devices. And so now that we have this in place, you'll actually see us enabling that feature in future releases. So you'll get a probably 20% plus uh, reduction in bandwidth when you connect over with your, with your tablet devices. So to conclude my section of the talk, a lot of enhancements in Vue 5.1. We continue to drive down and optimize the PCUIP encoder overheads. We continue to drive soft client performance. We continue to improve how we handle in a variety of network environments, especially hostile network environments. And we continue to drive user experience. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Vinet. Thanks, Lawrence, uh, for giving a nice overview on all the great performance improvements that has gone in 5.1. Um, so now I'm going to present some of the Vue 5.1 performance results. In particular, I'm going to compare PCIP display protocol with port ICA or SDX in Gen Desktop 5.6 and RDP 7. And then I'm going to give some results with the 3D software render performance in Vue 5.1. And finally, I'm going to give some of the storage improvement that we have done in Vue 5.1. So before presenting the results, let me give you the experimental setup that we have used. So we, for hosting virtual desktop, we have a IBM Blade uh, connected to an NFS storage array. And we have a typical Windows 7 desktop, one vCPU, one gig RAM, and the screen resolution we have used is 1152 by 864. This desktop is connected by a Windows XP client through dis different display protocol that we are comparing. And it is one vCPU, 768 MB RAM, and the same desktop resolution. And this client can be on a local branch office or it can be a remote branch office, right? So there can be different network conditions. And to simulate these different network conditions, we have three categories. Uh, LAN, 100 Mbps network latency with one millisecond latency. WAN, bandwidth is less, two Mbps, and the latencies is higher, 100 millisecond latency. And then we have extreme WAN where bandwidth is really low, 300 Kbps with 100 millisecond latency. And these are the protocol configurations that we have used. Uh, PCOIP, we have view 5.1, and we have disabled build to lossless. Uh, what this means is that if you disable this setting, you will get the perceptually lossless quality. And for all practical purposes, we have seen that you won't feel a significant difference if you're running an office kind of workload. So we recommend turning this setting off, and Chuck is going to talk more about this later on. And we also limit the maximum frame rate to 24. For port ICA, again, we have Gen Desktop 5.6. Uh, we limit the frame rate to 24. And we set the progressive compression level to low. And we find that equivalent uh, image quality with PCYP with this setting. For RDP, we have RDP 7. We enable the font smoothing. That means clear type is enabled. And we adjust the network profile for different network settings in RDP. Now that I have given you the setup, as well as the protocol, now what workload are we running? So what do we run in our day-to-day -day life as a typical VDI user? So we run office apps, Outlook, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, uh, browser for internet browsing, PDF, window media player. So v VMware View Planner uh, simulates these different applications and provide you the response time. How much time does it take to browse a PDF page or 
or a, uh, on Internet Explorer, how much time does it take? How much time does it to do a slideshow uh, presentation? So these are the different response time that gets collected by the view planner uh, workload. So let's look into this workload in more detail. So this is a next generation workload generator tool and sizing tool which lets you to do platform characterization. So for example, if you want to compare two different processor architectures such as Nehlem or Sandy Bridge and you want to see how many VMs per core can you support, you can do this with View Planner. And for example, if you also want to compare storage protocols, FC, iSCSI or NFS, then also you can use this tool to characterize your platform. Another thing I would like to point out that View Planner also has the capability to calculate or uh, to measure the complete end-to-end -end time for different user operations. So it evaluates truly the user experience from the client side. You can use also this tool to understand the scaling issues and identify the bottlenecks. So if you do a large scale run and you find out that your IOPS uh, or the IO latency is quite high, so you may want to add like more hard drives to your storage area. So these are different kind of things that you can do with View Planner. And for our testing dis for display protocol comparison, we have used all the workloads that are supported and we use think time of 10 seconds. Think time is essentially how much should I wait before the next operation can be started. And this tool is currently available to partners and uh, through customer through the professional service organization. So what are the typical performance metrics we really care about? What comes first to the mind? Right? You are thinking, right, desktop CPU usage because this directly affects how much the cost for your VDI deployment. The lower the CPU usage, you can consolidate more number of VMs on your host and that will reduce your cost for deployment. Next, bandwidth usage. If lower the bandwidth usage, you can have support more number of users on the network link and you will have better user experience. Right? Finally, comes down to the user experience. How much is the response time for different operations that you are doing when you are connected over a display protocol from to a remote desktop, right? So lower the response time, you'll have better user experience and more happy VDI users, right? So now that I've given you all the setup configuration, now let's look at the results here. So on the y-axis, we have normalized response time. On the x-axis, we have different network conditions. The blue one is PCOIP, red port ICA, and green is RDP. Here we have normalized the response time with respect to the maximum we have seen across all different display protocols and all network conditions. In this case, as you can see, RDP in extreme WAN has the highest response time. So that is normalized as 1.0 and everything is scaled with respect to that. Now if you look at the result for the LAN condition, we see that almost all three protocols has lower response time and they are quite usable. But as we, if we move to WAN, we see that PCOIP is handling quite well. It still has lower response time compared to both port ICA and as well as RDP. Now if you move from WAN to extreme WAN, we see that RDP latency really suits up. Whereas PCOIP and port ICA, they have very good reasonable user experience even in extreme WAN environments. Now let's look at the bandwidth usage. Again on the y-axis we have normalized bandwidth usage. In this case what we see is RDP in the LAN environment takes most amount of the bandwidth if we run this workload, view plan workload. And that is given 1.0 and everything is scaled with respect to that. So here we can see that in LAN condition and WAN and extreme WAN as we move, the bandwidth usage goes lower as expected. And if you look at LAN and extreme WAN, PCOIP is lower or at par compared to uh, port ICA and RDP. Now let's look at the CPU usage, because this directly affects the VDI or the cost of the deployment, like how much more consolidation you can achieve, how much the protocol is taking to remote the display. So let's, so Lawrence already pointed out earlier that we have done lot of optimization, optimizing the CPU usage for the protocol to transfer that display to the client side. So here we can clearly see that for LAN conditions, we are seeing about more than 20% CPU compared to port ICA. In this case, port IC in LAN condition has the highest CPU. So that is normalized as 1.0 and then everything is scaled with respect to that. So as we can see that for almost all network conditions, PCOIP is providing you almost more than 20% saving compared to port ICA. And here I would like to again point out that RDP while in extreme WAN and WAN, it's showing lower usage, but we, what we find that it throttles the video frame rate and lot of the apps. So it's kind of little bit uh, meaningless to interpret the results of RDP because it throttles uh, these numbers. 
So now let's look at the 3D software render performance in view 5.1. So again, to simulate this 3D or heavy VDI user, we again use view planner. In this case, we have 3D enabled, aero effects are enabled. Workload we have used is Office 2010. It exercises the aero effect even more. And view planner also has a support of doing custom apps. So to enable one of the 3D app, we have used Google Earth. The screen resolution is 1920 by 1200, much larger screen resolution than the earlier one. And we have think time of five seconds. So application are running twice the rate of what we did as a knowledge worker. And to, rend to do the software render performance, we have the processor uh, Nehla architecture E5620 with 2.4 gigahertz. A network is LAN. And we increase the number of VMs per core from one to seven. And this is what we get. On the y-axis, we have response time in seconds. On the x-axis, we increase the number of VMs per core. So if you look at the chart, what we see is that from, if we increase from one to five, we don't see that much increase in the response time. As we increase from five to six, we see a jump. And then from six to seven, we see a larger jump in the response time. And in our case, we have a threshold of 1.5 seconds. Beyond that, the user experience starts to uh, notice, uh, you can notice the user experience being degrading. So you, in this case, what we see that at six VMs per core for heavy VDI user, uh, you can have up to six VM, uh, VMs per core for a very heavy VDI user. Now let's look at some of the storage improvements in view 5.1. So we introduced the view storage accelerator feature that reduces the read IOPS quite significantly. What essentially it does is that it can cache the disk blocks and you can apply this to OS disk or your user data disk. So we did some experiment and for bootstorm operation, what we found that it can reduce the peak IOPS by 80% and average IOPS by 45%. So this is quite huge. It can reduce your storage cost or this, uh, this IOPS requirement for your storage quite dramatically. We also did some study with the steady state workload. While you're not doing bootstorm or login storm, if you're just doing uh, running a typical office user, how does this, how the response time looks? And this is what we get. On the y-axis, we have normalized response time. So no VSA, the green line is when there is no view storage accelerator feature applied. The blue one is when it's only applied to the OS disk. And the red one is when it's applied both OS and data disk. So we can see that about, we are seeing about 50 to 60% reduction in the application launch time which is quite good. And what we see that if both OS and data disk are applied for the view storage actually feature, we don't see that much difference. So we recommend that you may just want to apply the view storage actually feature to the OS disk. So why do we get this reduction in the application launch time? So this is uh, shown as here in for the read IOF chart. So we see that when there is uh, no view storage accelerator applied, we see about 70 IOS and then we see a 60% reduction in the read IOPS. So before I pass on to my next present colleague, uh, Chuck, so let me just summarize here. So with View 5.1 PCOIP, we have better user experience, better response time, lower bandwidth usage, as well as lower CPU usage. And for a very, very heavy VDI user, we are getting six VMs per core. And with View 5.1, we have introduced this View Storage Accelerator that can reduce the read IOPS significantly for bootstorm, login storm, as well as steady state workload. And there is separate talks also for separately focusing on storage improvements on View 5.1, so I would recommend uh, to check out. And with that, I would like to invite Chuck. And Thank you, guys. So now we're gonna move into um, some tuning and optimization for PCOIP. We learned a lot about all the new features and all the, the stuff that we've done on the development side to enhance the protocol. This is more about the day in, day out, how do you use it and what should you do with it. So I'm gonna start out talking about some tools that you can use and you know, full disclosure, this is completely a shameless plug. Uh, these are tools that I built and <laughs> that I put out. So I, I guess that makes me qualified to talk about them, but uh, it is what it is, guys. So the first thing is the PCRIP log viewer. The second one is gonna be the PCRIP configuration utility. We'll move then into what does tuning look like? Hey, there's quotation marks. Uh, that probably means we're gonna look at something. So there's a little treat there, and I'm gonna need your help uh, when we get to that section. I'm looking for your feedback. So um, I'll go over the primary tuning options. So what are the knobs and dials that you care about? But then I wanna take that into a discussion on what do those things mean? When you turn those knobs and dials, what are you doing to the end user? Because it's not just about the objective data. So 
We'll get into that, and then we'll talk about, I'll close with some tuning and optimization strategies. Um, Lawrence did say we're kind of, we're really tight on time. Uh, if I can't get to everything at the end, if you go to the VMware View Communities Bootcamp, I have a video there that covers uh, m the majority of that material, so you, you don't have to miss out on anything. So the piece of IP Log Viewer. This is a tool, it's not intended to compete or replace something like VC Ops Review. It's not intended to replace Lakeside or Liquidware or any of those vendors. That's not an enterprise scale tool. It's really just a, a pinpoint troubleshooting tool or a diagnostic tool um, that you can go and you know, pull files, pull log files from a, from a single desktop or point it to a desktop and get some real time information. So it supports both. Uh, when I say log files, I mean PC over IP underscore server, whatever random string, right? grab those files off the desktop, you run those through a front-end parser, and then that spits out an XML file that the viewer can display. So it visualizes what's going on with PC over IP. It does do real-time, so we added the WMI counters with View 5, and this supports that. It doesn't require an agent to be on the desktop. You do have to tweak your master image a little bit, uh, but once you make those tweaks to enable the viewer to come in, uh, you don't need to put anything else on there. So you can do it on your master, spin up desktops, and just connect to them directly pull stuff in real time. With that, I have my, my patented uh, WMI rewind feature, uh, which I'll talk about, because um, log files, by their nature, are archival, right? You can take those and store them somewhere, and if somebody says they have a problem, you can go back to that file and do it. When you're monitoring real time, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, but the viewer will allow you to go back in time while you're still monitoring in real time, but it will also allow you to save the session and then you can export it to an Excel file. And that Excel file sort of becomes your archival format. The good thing with that is then you can generate any kind of report you want. Uh, once the data is in a raw Excel spreadsheet, make any graphs you want. Where can you get it? Where can you learn about it? Uh, don't worry so much about the specific links here. I do have these are specific, but mindflexinc.net, that is my website. If you get there, you'll be able to get the tool. That's the same for the configuration utility. So this is what it looks like. Um, I know, you know, dark interfaces look cool on a PC. They don't look so great on a conference projector. Um, this is the real-time interface. And two important controls up here. This first slider controls the window in time that you're looking at. And by default, it's two minutes. So obviously, the, the leading edge of these graphs is now. This is two minutes uh, in the past. You can adjust that window. So if you just want to, if somebody calls you and they go, hey, you know, They've been having problems, you're monitoring their desktop, they say 10 minutes ago something was bad, you can just squeeze that window down and be able to examine what was going on. Or you can pull this slider, which is point in time. So you have the window of time that you're looking at and then you have the point in time. When you drag that back, that's that WMI rewind. It literally runs back through the log file. You can go all the way to the start of the session with that. Throw it all the way back uh, over to the right and you're right back at real time. This is the log file interface. So same viewer, same tool. Uh, it's just a little bit different. The log files do provide different, and in some cases, more data than the WMI stats. There's just more counters available within the log files to pull out, and information like how many displays are connected. You can see this is a, this is a multi-display setup. Uh, things like server information, what firmware it's running, uh, so on and so forth. If you set any tuning options, those will all show up in this extra tab section up at the top. And you can see this is just another tab so you can concurrently run multiple real-time sessions and or log files just within the same, you know, within one viewer instance. So you can be comparing a historical log file for a desktop while watching it in real time. So what do you look for? Why would you use this tool? The main thing is if you're doing, you know, diagnosis or you're trying to do tuning, um, really more for diagnosis than this first one, you want to look for packet loss and then a corresponding bandwidth um, limiting action of PC over IP, right? It adapts. So when it sees packet loss, bandwidth will come down. Um, if you are seeing that and you haven't followed all the best practices, you, you know, put QoS on PC over IP, uh, eliminated deep buffers on your switches and routers, if you're using tail drop instead of W red for your congestion avoidance mechanism, uh, that's where you're going to see, you're going to see the results of that. So it's not going to tell you specifically which of those is broken. We're not monitoring the network equipment, but it's going to be enough of a diagnosis to tell you that something is not right, allow you to enact some corrections for that, and then see uh, if, you, if you get any improvement. Uh, another thing is latency and variance. So latency by itself isn't a big deal. If you're offshoring you know, desktops uh, across the ocean, you're going to have 200 milliseconds of latency. You're going to have 250 milliseconds of latency. That's fine. It's the jitter. 
or the variance, just like with VoIP, right? VoIP gives you a very tight envelope on that. PC over IP doesn't like to see more than 20 or 30 milliseconds. So if you're, if you're pinging uh, off to that site and you've got 200, 220, 270, 220, 250, um, and it's all over the place, that's going to cause late arriving packets and out of order packets, which is PC over IP is going to view that as loss. So you'll see with these variance peaks, you'll see a corresponding peak in packet loss, you'll see a corresponding drop. So you can start to put all of these things together and get an idea of what's going on. Um, latency, usually when you have spikes like that, it's, it's from congestion, right? It's just that pipe is just getting backed up. So that may be an indicator that you need a bigger pipe uh, or you need to really examine what kind of content your users are doing. Uh, frames per second is not so much diagnostic, it's more when we get to the tuning aspect. Um, you know, PC over IP defaults to 30 frames per second, and if you leave it there, that's, that's great, but when your users do actions maybe that they shouldn't be, if you have an office worker and they're not supposed to be watching video or whatever and they start, you're gonna be throwing that across the network at 30 frames per second, um, and you'll be able to see that. You'll know that they're playing video. <laughs> um, but this will help you understand what the average is, and when you tune, you wanna tune to the average. So use the log viewer, point it at you know, a couple of desktops in accounting to see what the average frame rate on an accounting PC is, and that'll help you tune to that level. Quality table, which is in, only in the log files, it's not in the WMI stats. Um, it, it's just kind of a general health, uh, I use it as like a general health guide. This value goes from zero to I think six at the top, and the lower the value, the healthier the connection. So if you, if you see the quality table at zero, one, or two, despite what everything else is telling you, the end user experience is probably okay. PCRIP is probably doing all right. If you see it at three, four, or five, or even higher, um, it's telling you that PCRIP is aggressively trying to compress images. You hear the, the complaint with PCRIP is it looked fuzzy, or it was, the image looked weird, and it was slow to build. Um, you're gonna see a correspondence to that with a high quality table. So it's just a, at a glance, kind of a quick way if you're running through a log file to see uh, a point in time where an issue might have happened and then you can examine the other metrics that you read in there. Client decode rate is another diagnostic. If you see this value and it's consistently lower than the amount of traffic coming out that the, that the PCRP server is transmitting, um, that's telling you the encoding is just fine, the network is just fine, the client can't keep up, right? So if I'm sending 10 megabit, my client decode rate is, is three uh, and I'm getting low frame rate and poor responsiveness, it's not because PC over IP is broken, it's because the endpoint is underpowered. The PC over IP configuration utility. This is another app that you run um, in, the, in the desktop VM itself. And what it's there for is, there's kind of an issue with Vue um, where you can only apply one tuning profile per pool. You can assign a GPO to that pool. Uh, I didn't like that. I thought we should be able to apply different tuning profiles, you know, as appropriate. I, I, if I'm on a LAN at work and I go home, I wanna have different profiles for that. So this lets you create, manage, and edit those profiles and then apply them to the desktop. Now the bad news is you have to disconnect and reconnect because the PC over IP server only reads those parameters at session establishment. So that's kind of a bummer, but it's still better than not having the option at all. It does provide basic um, session monitoring and it also provides um, a health uh, indication. So this isn't, if you go to the site right now, you're not gonna be able to download the version that has this, it's kind of in a beta. Uh, it's out at customers and I'm getting their feedback and then I'm going to release it. I'm hoping to release it shortly after VMworld with the health indicator. Um, again, the links to get it. So what does it look like? This is the health indicator. So obviously we have our you know, green to red, healthy to bad. Uh, tuning profile, so if you click on the little icon on the sys tray, It'll bring this up, obviously you can manage, um, bring out the session stats, but you'll have this list of profiles that are defined and you can delete those, edit those, create as many as you want, delete them all, only have one or two, um, however many you want. You apply that, it will tell you, it'll pop up dialogue that says you have to disconnect, disconnect, reconnect, and the tuning profile is applied. Session status window, I know this doesn't play great, it's on a white background and it's semi-translucent. Again, this isn't meant to replace the log viewer or anything else, it's just, some basic information about, about the session, how much bandwidth, what's the frame rate, um, things like that, how much audio bandwidth is being consumed. And this is that health score pop out. So when you see that indicator change in the sys tray, you can bring this up and it'll report on individual values. So just like I talked about before, you know, is the variance becoming very high 
and is that why I'm seeing poor performance? And you know, when variance drops, am I seeing packet loss with that? So it gives the end user a little more visibility into that. Um, so what is it good for? It allows you to, to get rid of that one GPO per pool tuning limitation. But be, be careful of GPO clashes, right? So this is writing to the registry. GPO is going to come and write to the registry. If you're going to use this to apply your tuning profiles, uh, don't put those settings in the GPO. Use the GPO for things like clipboard policy or uh, you know, USB device accessibility policy. Don't use it for the PC over IP tuning parameters. Um, it also is a way to inform users of network conditions. And what I love about this and what I've heard the feedback is there's a great placebo effect that comes from this. So users look at the sys tray when things are bad, they look at the sys tray and if it's red, they feel better. Uh, it doesn't fix anything, but they're like, yeah, see, it's bad. Right? It's, it's that confirmation and they don't call the help desk. They're like, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, and, and so that's great. I mean, as I should just make it turn red r randomly, but um, that, uh, because then they never to keep them guessing. Uh, but, but there's a nice placebo effect with that. And, and, and I mean, it, it's legitimate too. It, it, it legitimately helps cut down help desk calls. I mean, it allows you to put in place policy that says, you know, if, if that's bad, call your ISP first or do, right, do these things that you can rely on the user, if it's, especially if it's like a work at home user or something, um, to, to do before they get to you. Um, but that is, I, I always get a giggle out of that. Uh, many people have reported <laughs> it just makes people feel better. Um, in the future, the great thing would be to eliminate the, the disconnect reconnect. Well, you know, I've, I have my legal disclaimer, so I can say that's probably going to happen. <laughs> uh, I can't say when, but when it does happen, it opens the door to some really, really creative possibilities, uh, like having like how we have location aware printing. We can have location aware profiles. So you could set it via subnet, via MAC address, right? Think of tying it to a device. If I know where that device is, if I know this is a Wi Fi network, I can apply a profile just you know, dynamically as the user moves. Um, it opens the door to tools that would allow you to um, tune PC over IP in real time. So as an admin to build those profiles, you could call up a tool and be adjusting those knobs and dials, you know, on the desktop and seeing that effect in real time. And when you get to the tuning that, that you want, you're seeing the right things, you export that and it becomes part of there. So there's some cool possibilities once we get that, we'll probably get that. So that's the good news. All right, so let's move into what does tuning look like. These are usually the options that matter when we talk about tuning or optimizing PC over IP. Build, build to lossless, so enabled or disabled. Maximum session bandwidth on the bandwidth floor. Max initial image quality and minimum image quality. Frame rate. Obviously, disabling audio is the best option if you don't need it. But if you have to have audio, setting a bandwidth limit. And that's great. I talk about those all the time and I get a call from an SE out in the field and he's like, I'm at a customer, we're doing a bake off, what do I need to do? And I go, you know, 2742, you know, and, and they do that and they're like, great, those, those are the numbers, right? The numbers, the numbers, the numbers, give me the numbers. Um, that's great, but trying to hit a number doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on with the protocol. And, you know, that same tech will call me the next week and go, I'm at a bake-off, what are the numbers, right? They, they haven't learned anything, they just got the information and ran away. What I'm trying to do is, not only for internal VMware, but for our customers, is come up with a way to, you know, generate content that helps people, you know, teach you to fish, I guess, right? Helps people understand that tuning is a trade-off. There's an art to this, which is, if I'm only concerned about the objective numbers, I'm not really thinking about the impact to my end users, and the art of balancing those is what tuning is about. Uh, this probably isn't going to project terribly well up here, but you know, there's always a cost. I, I, if there was a magic switch that could cut bandwidth in half and increase image fidelity twofold, we'd already do that. That would be the default. Um, there isn't. <laughs> so um, if you want to reduce bandwidth, you're going to reduce image quality. If you look over here, hopefully you can see there's a lot of very small and fine points of light. It's a starry sky. If you look over here, it's, you know, from the same sky, these stars are much bigger because they're getting smeared together. It's really heavily compressed. A lot of stars are missing. I mean, this whole area just doesn't have anything, and they've all just kind of been smeared into this gray. So, you know, as you get really aggressive with tuning, there is this visual impact. So my goal with this is to, to produce that content, like I said, right, that merges the objective facts with what, do, what benefit do I get from tuning as far as bandwidth reduction or, or, or CPU reduction even um, with the subjective reality versus what does that look like? 
so ultimately, you know, to make more chucks, right? I'm tired of being the only guy uh, who gets the calls from the SEs. Um, and this is still a work in progress. Uh, I've been working on this for, for quite some time, so uh, I want your help and your feedback. How did I do this? Um, HD video content, I wanted to pick content very carefully. This is actually a time lapse film taken with a DSLR. Why is that important? Because every frame is perfectly focused. The point of this content is to show you the impact of compression and, and being more aggressive with the content if it's, if it's the, you know, the fight scene from Transformers with shaky cam and motion blur, you're not gonna know the difference, right? I mean, compress the heck out of it and it, it all kind of looks the same. So no motion blur, um, and it needed to be something that was compelling. Uh, I've had to watch this video probably a thousand times. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to watch it a lot of times, so it needs to be material that you, you get excited about watching. Um, the rest of it, pretty standard, right? Windows 7, guest and client, local LAN, this wasn't about constraining bandwidth except in the tuning. Um, and then I went through this tuning progression, and this is cumulative. So we start with out of the box, we move, you know, simple optimization of disabling built to us. we move through frame rate, and then at this point, you know, the way this table works is, at this point, assume we hold this value, and then we apply this on top of it. Then we hold that value, and so on. So it gets more and more aggressive. The goal of this isn't to reach an optimal tuning, it's to reach a tuning that's really, so that you can see it, it's really aggressive, right? So it's not necessarily the right, but it, but it has the desired result. So what does it look like? All right, now we finally get to that part. Uh, I'm gonna go through a couple videos here. I'm gonna let the last one play all the way through, but I wanna give you an idea of, of what this looks like. So this first video, uh, every one of them starts out. What's that? Uh, yeah, unfortunately I don't know that we can. So this is out of the box defaults. I wish we could, I know. It's, it's, there's a couple of quality things I'll help you through, but I just wanna get you a feel for the content. And I'm really only gonna let this play for a few seconds. So you would go through the video. This is the subjective portion. At the end, you get the objective portion. So I'll pause this for a moment. You can see that in the end, it took about 628 megabytes to do this test, right? Um, pretty high bandwidth peaks, high frame rate, right? It looks great, I mean, it's really good, but there's, there's a cost for that. So let's move into, I'm gonna move right to the last um, tuning progression, so the most aggressive uh, option. So build to lossless, low frame rate, image quality reduced, audio bandwidth reduced, and a five megabit cap. You can already see it's a little more herky-jerky. And uh, it, 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 again, you really won't be able to see it here, but uh, we're hoping to make this content available in a form where you can, you can view it locally and really see. There's a lot of compression artifacts. This is, is kind of blurry and splotchy. But you know, the good news, if all I cared about was numbers, is 123 megabytes. That's, that's awesome, right? And screw the users, uh, that's great. Um, that, that's the problem, right? Is if you don't understand what it looks like, you look at this and you're like, that's, we got our settings. Um, and, and that may not be right, okay? So the cool thing with this is after you get all these videos in this progression, once you have that material, uh, which we never had before, is you can do interesting things like put them side by side. So the audio for this is from the high quality the high quality one. So the thing I'll tell you to watch, since you can't see the compression artifacts, just watch the sky. I'll let this run a little bit longer. Watch as the clouds move from left to right and right to left. Now you start, now it becomes interesting, right? So I'm gonna move through this next video and I'm gonna let the whole thing play. And what this is, is an AB comp. So it's gonna switch between the out of box settings, video and audio, and the most aggressively tuned settings. So pay attention to the audio, watch the sky, see if you can catch any of the compression artifacts. I know it's tough, 
blades of grass and things like that come in. So this is high quality. And now we've shifted over to the tuning one. You don't notice much in the audio here. A little bit of distortion. Just wait. Thank you, yeah. So it's pretty cool, right? It's, it's a cool video until you've seen it a thousand times, so. <laughs> so here's my plea to you, right? I remember I was gonna ask you guys for help. Is this valuable? Does this, okay, good. Don't all shout this out. The point of this is, how do we deliver this to you? What format would you consume this? Is this an online course? Is this something that you download with a workbook that goes with the videos? Think about that. Uh, post, com go to Mindflux and post comments, and I'll do that. Uh, I'll meet with anybody, I'll give you my info, you know, send it to me, and, and I need to know how to take this forward and present it so that we can package it properly, that it's, that it's the most valuable to you. Uh, and then obviously, if there, is there something I'm missing, right? You're like, well, that looked great, I saw X, Y, and Z, but you didn't have W, uh, and I need that. Um, so think about that, I, I need your help um, to, to make sure that we can produce this and get it out. We've kind of had some fits and starts internally this has been around a long time, uh, but we haven't been able to, to get it into the hands of uh, you know, partners and customers yet. So now we're gonna burn through, because I don't have a lot of time left, the tuning optimization strategy. So let's just jump right back into numbers. <laughs> um, the first thing to know is client choice definitely affects where you're gonna be and what you can tune. Um, it's, it's, it used to be in four, view 4.6, everything was kind of equal. When we went to View 5.0, we added three big features that had a pretty significant impact on bandwidth reduction. It's built to lossless client-side cache and a new text codec. You can see that the soft clients support everything. Windows, Mac, and Linux, great, you're covered. 
we talk about the mobile clients, you don't get that client-side cache, and that's, that's big, because client-side cache provides a very big reduction. Um, but Lawrence has talked about, you know, with the, the new enhancements in 5.1, with cache compression, it may be feasible now to include that. So it's not there today, but it may be. When we talk about zero clients, when you move to the Terra One, you don't get the text codec or client-side cache. And what that really means, uh, build to losses doesn't have a huge impact. What it really means is a Terra One Zero client looks a lot like View 4.1 as far as bandwidth. But the recently announced Terra Two absolutely supports a text codec. It does support client-side caching, but it's implemented differently, and it's not quite as effective as a software cache right now. Uh, that will change going forward as we do software releases and as they do firmware releases. You can expect that to, to get a lot closer to parity in the software side, but it's not there today. So know this, if you're trying to tune and the user's at work on a zero client in a conference room and then they go home and you're looking at their profile, it's gonna be totally different uh, if it's a Terra One Zero client. So don't, you know, don't freak out and panic, but know what you're doing. So I'm gonna go through these really quick. Disable build the losses, this is a no-brainer, just do it. There's a handful of use cases where it makes sense to um, not disable it and let the image build to pixel perfect. But for any type of office work or anything use case, if you're not viewing medical images, then you, you don't need to worry about this really and you're gonna save some bandwidth. Um, maximum session bandwidth, there's no hard and fast rule for this, but if you're pushing view desktops on a five megabit link, the default setting for this is 90 megabits. Um, PCRIP will figure out you only have five, but there's no sense in making it you know, beat its head against the wall. Uh, trying to get to 90 and then realizing you only have five. Just set it, give it an envelope to work within and then let it adapt, uh, adapt within that envelope. Session floor, this is kind of an interesting one. Um, session floor comes into play when PCRP needs to use bandwidth but can't get as much bandwidth as it needs. So if it needs to use two megabit and the pipe is very congested, it will start backing off. And if you don't have a floor set, by default there is no floor, it'll back off to zero. Uh, because it's trying to be a good neighbor on the network. It's trying to not congest the pipes any further. But on certain networks, especially Wi-Fi or cellular, and this has gotten better now um, with some of the enhancements of 5.1, but those, those networks are bursty and lossy just generally. And they can trick PC over IP. There may be tons of bandwidth available, but PC over IP will start adapting because it sees that loss. Raising the floor will tell it to not be so nice. So it will say, when you see congestion and you start to come down, don't go any lower than this. Just push through. Just throw packets at it, and that tends to give a better experience on those, those inherently lossy networks. Maximum frame rate. Again, this is one I talk about a lot. If, if you're not doing multimedia, you need to be pretty aggressive on this if you wanna see any benefit. Um, people, you know, if you're just typing an email or you're typing into Word, um, you know, this is from an actual log file, look at that average frame rate. Um, you'll see it visualized in the log view and everything else, but if you say, well, the default's 30, I'm gonna go to 20. Think of all the bandwidth I'll save. And they're averaging six, uh, you didn't save anything. So uh, you have to tune to that average uh, and then you'll clip those peaks. So when they, get, when they do naughty things, uh, you'll, you'll save the bandwidth on the naughty things. Uh, if you are doing multimedia though, beware that anything below 15 is, is probably getting very aggressive for multimedia. Users will notice. Uh, maximum initial, initial image quality. Anytime you're on a WAN, oh, really almost globally, I like to say just start at 70 uh, and see, see where you're at. If things build quickly enough, the visual fidelity impact is actually quite low, but the bandwidth gains can be very good with that. That's a, that's a very good value, uh, especially for multimedia, but really just in general, you'll get some benefit out of that. And then audio bandwidth limit. Um, if you must use audio, if you can't just disable it, the default setting for this is 500 kilobits. So, uh, everybody talks about, you know, I want, that 50, I want that 50K desktop, 50K desktop. At the default settings, when you, when you have a Windows dialog pop up and it goes ding, 500K, right, just to send that. So uh, there's no point. My recommendation on this is set it to 100K. Uh, start there. That's a value that maintains reasonably good audio fidelity, but it's cutting the bandwidth from the default to one-fifth, so pretty big savings there. Um, and then go up or down from there, depending. If, if you have a heavy dictation use case and you know, it's medical dictation and they need to hear every word very clearly, maybe it's worth having a little higher audio fidelity. Uh, but for anything else, you know, turn it off or set it as low as you possibly can. So start with the basics, right? Do the best practices first. Tuning, 
will, will never make up for a poorly configured network. If you're not putting PC over IP in QoS and it's just hanging around in the scavenger queue and constantly getting dumped because you still have tail drop and you, know, you didn't size your pipes correctly, then like taking 20% off by tuning, it isn't gonna save anybody anything. So do that first. Um, and, and then utilize the information. So there's really no excuse. You know, I, I like to say now, if, if, you're, if you consider yourself a Vue admin, um, you know, back in Vue 4.0 uh, 4 and, and 4.0x, um, there really weren't any good tools. It was very hard to get visibility. I went to a lot of customers and when we were you know, having issues with PC or IP, and they were completely lost. It was like, well, the sales guy said it adapts. What's it doing? And, and we couldn't explain it. There was no, we couldn't show what it was doing. Uh, which was really the genesis of the log viewer. That was the point. All the information was there, but it was completely unintelligible. <laughs> um, the log viewer, you know, makes it so that it's visible. We have the WMI counters. You have VC ops review. You have all these tools that you can do. So it really behooves you as part of your job to understand what the protocol is doing. You can't just throw your hands up, uh, you know, and 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 say that you you have no ability to to see what's going on. So use the tools. You know, once you're confident that the network is healthy. Use those tools. Figure out what you need to adjust, or figure out if you're doing diagnostic work. Vary them one at a time. Uh, you know, some things you can do multiple, but usually you want to see what the impact is. So drop the frame rate, talk to your users, and see what their experience is, and then look at the objective numbers. Did you get a savings? Like, did you impact the users and you got a 2% savings? Well, is it worth it then, right? Vary the image quality, do the same thing, right? But you want to measure those one at a time. If you change all of them, it's just like when you're troubleshooting and you go and you fix 10 things and then the same problem happens again and you have to fix 10 things because you have no idea which one of the 10 actually fixed your problem. Uh, the, the tuning and optimizing PCRP is, is no different from that. Just take your time, uh, you know, measure, measure, and make sure you do it right. And then if all else fails, reach out for help. At that point, throw your arms up. Cry out. So, and, and really, that's it, guys. That's the end of the show. So...